Hello and a very warm welcome to our event today on the role of transition finance, a conversation with EBRD president Odile renaud -Basso. Uh, Odile, it's a real pleasure to host and welcome you today. Um, it's been some time since we last met and again, unfortunately, we don't meet in person, um, but it's really great uh, to engage with you. Um, in a discussion about uh, transition finance, how the role of the EBRD is evolving, and um, you know, understanding really also from you how you see um, the situation in the countries of operation um, uh, of the EBRD, so the countries where you operate, how you see the economic situation currently, what is your sort of planning um, uh, of the strategy, how we will get out of um, this um, a very difficult situation, which affects, of course, all economies across the world. It's a major health crisis, but it's also a, a major economic um, uh, um, uh, crisis. Um, and um, the exit from that strategy, from that crisis, is really important and has, and I think development banks play an important role in, in funding, um, perhaps rebuilding back uh, better, um, as President Biden uh, likes to say. Um, uh, uh, the, our economies after this massive shock. So, so it's really a pleasure to welcome and host you today, um, Odile. It's great to see you again. And I want to first give you the floor uh, for some uh, initial remarks. Then we engage in a conversation. And then, of course, I also want to hear from you, our audience. What are your questions um, for the president, um, to the president of the EBID? Um, you can ask them by going on Slido and typing the code EBRD and then type your question and I can I can see those questions on my smartphone. So thanks again uh, for joining us today and Odile, I look forward to your initial remarks. Thank you very much, Guntram, and it's really a pleasure for me to be with you today. Unfortunately, it's not in Brussels, it's not in Brugel where we meet, and I would have loved to see you in person, but, but we adjust to the circumstances and Reminding how, I mean, the time where Bruegel was set up and so forth, I'm, I'm very impressed by all the, all the way that has been gone through by, by your think tank and I think all the success and, and the, the very strong um, influence you have on all um, European related issues and so forth. So it's very, it's for me really a pleasure to be with you. And indeed, we are facing a situation which is absolutely exceptional uh, in all the countries, I mean, the countries in which we live, in all the countries of operation in which we intervene as um, European Bank, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. You know that I've, this is already almost a little bit more than uh, 100 days I spent in the bank. And um, I must say, I've been uh, very impressed by the reaction the bank has, I mean, uh, to the crisis, what it, how it provided support for the countries of operation and uh, how we see uh, the next steps. But I mean, that's also, this year will be the 30th anniversary of the EBRD. And I think it's also an opportunity to see all the way that has been um, um, gone through with all the transformation of the bank, uh, while I think remaining at the very, um, very uh, strong on its core mandate, which is to accompany transition, to accompany economies moving towards a more market-based economy uh, in countries um, that are stick, I mean, committed to and applying the principles of uh, multi-party democracy, liberalism, and market economics. So that's our mandate. And I think that during the crisis, um, we focused very much on how we can provide support targeted to the crisis. It's um, the biggest crisis ever uh, that countries of operation um, have known since World War II. I think, of course, the biggest since the creation of the bank. And um, when, when the bank realized the magnitude of the shock that would be likely to come in, um, in the spring 2020, in March, we decided to implement uh, to launch what was what we call the solidarity package with new instruments um, in order to tackle what was the emergency. And it's very much, I mean, it echoes a lot what has been done at national level with uh, liquidity support, uh, debt restructuring for companies that uh, um, 
and difficulties to play to play to pay back. Um, support for the vital infrastructure that uh, in order to um, to keep the, the, the activity of this vital infrastructure open for the benefit of the people and so forth. So really, we really shifted very quickly our support to these emergency needs. And um, this explained the fact that we have reached exceptional level of activity, 11 billion last year, which uh, was the highest level of financing ever met. Um, and with um, a strong involvement of this new, this specific instrument, now I think we are at a point, I mean, and this helped, I think, the, 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 our clients and our countries of operation to deal with, with the situation, to avoid, to limit bankruptcies and so forth. I think that we were all thinking that 2021 will be the year to build back better. We see now that um, the crisis is longer than expected. And in a number of countries in which we operate, the first wave has been been very limited, had a very limited real impact, but now we see a number of countries very much um, touched by, much, touched much more strongly by the second wave. This is, for example, the case of uh, some Eastern European countries, Western Balkans, Central Asia, and so forth. So we, the impact of the second wave and the economic impact will be, um, is likely to be quite strong. So the key question now is how do we manage to, um, I mean, to, to focus on building back better, because I think it's very important while, I mean, and how, uh, how do we tilt, I mean, we, we make the balance between emergency support and uh, this agenda of uh, building back better. So I think that's, that's the point where we are. And, um, and we are dealing with countries that are in very different situation because some, I mean, the, the economic impact has been quite diverse. Some are very dependent on tourism, for example. This is the case, for example, of Croatia, Georgia. Some are, are much more dependent on uh, oil prices. Um, this is the case of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan. So, I, so the, the economic impact has been diverse, but overall it has been huge. On average, we assess that uh, our forecast is that um, GDP would have reduced by uh, more than 4% in 2020, and we expect a rebound above 3% in 2021, but most likely not recovery from the uh, 2020, the previous GDP level before 2022, which is also the case um, in, uh, in, um, in other European countries. Um, so I think the bank is, is very much fit for purpose, uh, knows, I mean, it's very, you know, that it's a bank that is focusing mainly on the private sector, with a strong focus on the private sector. And I think that for me, the three priorities would be agility, A like agility, I try to sum it, uh, sum it up in a motto with three letters, A like agility, B, B like building back better, and C like client and countries focus, which is uh, basically what we have to do. Um, and I think that we managed to deliver in 2020. We need to continue to, uh, but with a shift of agenda to building back better, as you were mentioning. Thanks a lot, uh, Odile, uh, for these introductory remarks and also for talking a bit about um, your strategy at the end. So the ABC, uh, it's a very nice, uh, catchy, catchy slogan. Um, and of course, I think you, you mentioned already the, the three points. So agility, build back better and, um, and countries and um, I guess the policy focus on the countries. And I was wondering if I could push you a little bit you talked already quite a bit about the the build back better but let me still push you a bit on on that that point um, um just to give us a sense you know uh, perhaps with some concrete examples also um how the ebrd um can help i mean at the situation in a situation where we have the health crisis we want to get out of this health crisis let's say we we will at, at the towards the se the second half of the year have the relatively universal vaccination. Let's hope that this will all work out. Then the focus will have to shift, right? And there's the whole discussion about green, um, uh, you know, how to ensure a green turn, uh, an economy that is better, so build back better, so meaning ideally a green economy um, and perhaps a more equal economy, um, more inclusive economy. Um, 
So, so how do you see these priorities and how do you see the bank fitting in there and, and really supporting also the private sector in this transition to a new economy? So for us, I think that um, when we think about building back better, we see basically three key priorities which have been endorsed by our shareholders on a unanimous basis, which give us a strong mandate to uh, deliver on these three cross-cutting priorities, and they are very close to the priorities you mentioned. The first one is indeed green. And uh, we have a clear target that has been set up for 2025 to which to have at least 50% of our financing considered as green. And what is important is, is uh, in, in this dimension of building back better is what happened with the crisis. In 2019, we had more or less 46% of our financing considered as green. And these figures dropped dramatically in 2020, showing I mean, the shift in our activity because it reached something like 29%. And um, because we were focusing much more on you know, working capital, trade finance, uh, support to emergency support to banks uh, with, no, with no specific conditionality on green financing in, in their own lending, um, support to some key infrastructure that were not, uh, did not have any green dimension. So that's, it has had a huge impact on our green financing. And I think it was absolutely right because when the economy is really collapsing, what you need to do is to address these emergency needs uh, immediately. Otherwise, uh, the risk was really to have a full collapse. But now the issue is how do you, do you go back to the... Um, to, 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 to reach the target. We, we, our shareholders have put a high level of ambition with a target of 40% in 2021. And we already see that it's going to be a big challenge because um, that's, I mean, with the crisis being longer, I mean, the second wave, the risk of variant and so forth, it's, you can still see a lot of emergency needs and um, longer term project, may, there, is, there is a risk to see them postponed, see them not seen as a key priority and so forth. So that's something we really need to focus on and to, have, to be very serious about in the discussion with all the countries in which we intervene. The second priority is um, equal opportunities and inequalities with also a strong focus on gender. Uh, we intervene in a number of countries where gender equality is a very important issue. And uh, what we are trying to do is really to bring this agenda of equality, of opportunities, of training, and so forth uh, at the forefront. And how do we do that? We, we use the financing we have, for example, to develop a strategy, to help our clients to develop a strategy to uh, address these issues. For example, we had a, a big project in transportation in Egypt. And in relation to this, to the financing, to the loan we provided, we developed with a company uh, of public transportation um, a strategy to, to fight against uh, women and har harassment in the transportation. So that's a way to, and, and I, I think that it's proven very efficient. There has been a big communication campaign and so forth, and that was a way to, to to address this building back better um, with uh, finance, I mean, financing a project which uh, per se was good for the city and so forth, but not necessarily aiming at inequalities. And the second priority, the third priority is, is digitalization. And we see a lot of that already taking place because we, I mean, there had been in, um, in our countries of operation a very large adjustment. Uh, like everywhere to digital, like we are just showing today. So adjusting to new means of working, new means of uh, uh, delivering, of, of working with the clients and so forth. And this will be one of the third priority we have. And to do that, I think that we will work on the in financing instrument, support to uh, technology companies and so forth, but also a lot of support to SMEs, advisory support to help them, uh, I mean, adapt their instrument, their tools, their way to work to the new challenges. We've already provided a lot of support in the context of the crisis. And that's something I discover really because it's not, it's not a loan, it's not a real banking activity, but it's supporting um, advisory so as to facilitate the development of the private sector. We really finance consultants, advisors for companies, but it's a very small companies so as to help them develop in their strategy. And that works 
quite well. It's very well appreciated in the countries in which we activate that. And um, it's, it's a very powerful tool to, for example, develop digitalization. Of course, the big challenge will be, um, I mean, if everything, I mean, when the economic uh, priorities are more the survival and build, I mean, development and so forth, it's, it may be challenging. But I think that you, there are some, a lot of things that can be done that can be very efficient in the very short term for supporting the activity and so forth, while on the other hand, preparing the ground for a better future. One example I will always take is the issue, of, for example, of um, refitting of building energy efficiency. This has a short-term impact on the activity, so it's a good project for a recovery plan and because you're spending, it has short-term short -term expenditure, providing work to people uh, in the building area and so forth. And on the, other, on the other hand, it's very efficient in the long term to um, contribute to the climate challenge. So there are ways, I think, that we can do both, but of course, um, I mean, it's, it will be, it will imply a lot of work. One big challenge I, I will see for us is that we have a big objective to have uh, at least 75% of our financing in the private sector and an ambitious uh, climate target or green financing target. And I think there is, there may be a bit of tension there because you, one can realize that often the development of a renewable energy and so forth in a number of countries, it takes more the form of public financing than on private financing. So one of our key tasks, I think, is to, to, to develop private sector capabilities to finance this green recovery. And this also, I think we, I mean, this is also related to the macro environment in which we will operate. In the context of the crisis, the countries, the emerging countries in which we intervene have, I mean, provided a lot of support to companies and or to, to, I mean, to hold the economy, household companies and so forth. They have increased at that level. So over time, this will be a challenge. It's not, they have, overall debt level lower than what we see in the Euro area or in the US and so forth. But still for emerging countries, this may provide challenges in the long term for access market access and so forth. So it, it may, so developing the private sector financing, private project and so forth, including in infrastructure, renewable and so forth is something which is absolutely essential, I think, if we want to, and not relying only on public infrastructure, if we want to deliver on the climate objective. And what that's an area where we are particularly good at because we we work a lot on the policy dimension, uh, reforming, for example, policy energy uh, framework so, so as to facilitate auction of renewable and to allow bringing in uh, private sector players. Thank you. Um, so, so I have uh, perhaps before we turn to some questions and let me remind our audience um, that, uh, you know, you can ask questions by going on Slido and then typing in the code EBRD um, and then I can see your questions popping up here in on my smartphone. Um, but before I turn to the questions, I mean, let me um, perhaps push you and ask you a bit about um, where you see um, the role of the EBRD um, in the uh, development uh, bank um, architecture and, uh, and really also in the European uh, context. And um, perhaps, I mean, there's of course one debate is, you know, what is the role of the EIB? What is the role of the EBRD? And there has have been some, some discussions around this, but then I, I think there's another, um, angle that I find quite interesting is that, um, and you know, we've been writing recently a paper on sort of the implications of the Green Deal, the European Green Deal um, for um, uh, geopolitically the implications, but I mean, one important geopolitical dimensions is our neighborhood. And so, so what, the, the point that we, uh, we emphasized in our paper, recent paper was that um, you know, the, um, the exiting from uh, carbon fossil fuels um, uh, by the EU has, of course, important implications for um, some of our neighboring countries, such as Algeria, but also uh, um, uh, Russia, perhaps also Azerbaijan, countries that directly export um, energy um, 
to uh, to us and will be able to export much less um, once the once the green deal is is successful so so perhaps you can give us a sense of you know where do you see the ebrd sort of in the european development architecture and how can the ebrd um, help in the neighborhood really to um, to help the countries in the neighborhood adjust to the consequences of the green deal adjust to um, you know basically adjust to the new situation and and um, and how what's the delineation of responsibilities between I think you have a term team Europe or something like this so so it's um, the EBRD but then we have also DEFCO uh, in Brussels we have the national development agencies um, just if you give us a bit of a sense um, of EBRD in the European architecture so EBRD is a very, very unique animal in a way because it's a multilateral development bank. So we have uh, 71 shareholders. Um, it was, it's, I mean, with a progressive enlargement of the number of shareholders, some new shareholders coming in uh, regularly, uh, and 38 countries of operation. And it, it's, it's, so it's a multilateral institution, um, but with a very strong European backbone or very strong European heart because by the statute, um, European countries and European institutions have the majority. So together with uh, all, all EU member states, all 27 EU member states are shareholders of the bank, together with EIB and with the Commission. And so the European um, can have, I mean, Europe is very strong uh, in the EBRD. And the, um, the core of the mandate for the, the bank is, in a way, the stabilization of the European neighborhood. It started with the uh, Eastern European countries uh, following the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. Then there were progressive enlargement to um, Central Asia, Western Balkans, and um, following the, sp the Arab Spring, um, Mid Southern Mediterranean countries, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, and um, and so it it's um, it's it has a, a sort of complex identity, uh, and it's clearly part in my view very I mean one of the key element of the European architecture, um, because the Commission, the European Commission is one of the largest contributors. So we receive some donors contribution from a number of countries, but including very much from the, Europe, the European Commission. And we are one of the implementing partner of the European Commission in developing financial tools using you know, grants element with um, land, lending capacity, or technical assistance financed by the EU European Commission so as to deliver on um, European priorities. So we are one of the implementing partner in the Commission with a strong role in, um, in some EU countries, but also outside the EU countries. What, what characterizes the EBRD is its mandate focusing on the private sector, which I think is a very strong uh, characteristic. So we, we do a bit of public sector, but very much a lot on, in the sub-sovereign, so working with local authorities and so forth, and in sovereign project, but in the, in the, in the, in the sense that they, have, they will have an impact for the, they are important to unlock private sector capabilities. However, all the characteristic is to have, to be very um, deeply grounded in the, in, to be a very strong um, presence in the ground because we have more than one third of our, t of our staff working in the countries of operation, uh, which are let's so 38 countries of operation. And um, third characteristic, I think, is to bring together uh, financing and policy. So we are very much supporting. We have a lot of policy dialogue with the authorities and trying to promote reforms that will be key for development of the private sector, for example, enterprise governance, fight against corruption, um, energy framework so as, so as to facilitate uh, intervention on private sector uh, investors, um, sometimes educate, I mean, some reforms related to training. So we really look at uh, when providing some financing support, accompanying that with policy dialogue, policy reform, promoting reform that will be important to transform and to ensure the transition of the country. And that's very, um, very specific and important features, which makes us very much like really 
Development Bank with a strong reform agenda. And in that sense, we are very different from the EIB, who has a much bigger balance sheet, but is, doesn't consider it, uh, itself as a policy maker, but really as a rule, I mean, the policy, policy taker with policies being defined by, uh, I don't know, the commission most likely. Or, so we have a very different approach. And, and, and way to work. EIB is much more uh, Luxembourg based, small, very small, no team in the ground or very small representation office, uh, and much more um, in the large, with working with large tickets, large tickets. The average size of the uh, EBRD project is uh, five times or six times smaller than EIB. So we are, we are able to finance very small projects like three million uh, financing and so forth. So we're really going into the, the detail and I mean, as a smaller projects for SMEs in, in the country of operation, having representation not only in the capital, but also in the economic centers and, and so forth. So very much uh, boots in the ground, as we say in the bank. Um, so that's, in a way, I think that we are very complementary with the EIB. And uh, as I was saying, we are really, we see us as very, very um, I mean, part, clearly part of the European architecture and being able to deliver on some of the European uh, agenda. What's important to, to note is that the priorities I was defining, I was presenting before are completely, I mean, the same than the EU priorities. And what, from my perspective, what is, I mean, from an EU perspective, I think the EBRD can be also a very important player in terms of bridge, I mean, bring, bring, bringing together non-EU partners on um, to support the transformation of the EU neighborhood, the financing of uh, uh, the development of these countries. And in a way, when the, the Commission is really willing to, to develop the geopolitical agenda and so forth, I see that, I think in my view, the EBRD can be the bank on which the EU is very, I mean, has a strong influence, was to bring to develop its agenda at a broader scale, bringing on this agenda the US, Japan, and so forth. So I think it's, I mean, in terms of geopolitical way, um, reasoning, it's it, it's a way for the EU to to be able to project itself a little outside, a little bit like Japan has the Japanese Development Bank or the US has the Inter-American Development Bank. So they are they are strong players. They do not have the necessarily the majority, but they are they, they are very influential in the dynamics of this bank. The last the last point I wanted to make is one of the value of the EBRD in the European architecture. It is the, the only play the only institution where you have the beneficiary countries so, so the countries of operation being also shareholders and that's an important way to um, develop uh, to ensure that there is an alignment on the agendas and so we are intervening also on areas which are very sensitive for Europe as I was saying for example the Western Balkans and in this area for example we work very closely with the commission in the West Western Balkan investment framework where we have a sort of very integrated framework where we discuss policy priorities and uh, with a strong leadership from the commission from this and then uh, i mean coordinating on the financing um, and and ensuring that there is a sort of i mean all players are working together so as to deliver with the maximum efficiency so that's why i think we are very uh, i mean willing to work very closely with the commission and uh, and and in order to to I mean, to be effective in the countries in which we intervene, we also intervene in, in areas where um, our presence is very important. I would say, for example, Central Asia to counterway to, I mean, because it's areas where, for example, big part, big players like China are also very influential. So having a, another MDB is very present on the ground and cl working closely with the authorities at the highest level and so forth is also a very, I mean, powerful instrument so as to ensure that financing is provided with the highest standard, uh, I mean, in the transparent manner and so forth. Uh, well, th that last point uh, is actually a perfect uh, opening to a question that we got here, and so let me let me push you on on that point um, raised by Gerhard Gerhard Stahl. Um, he's asking, well, could you comment on the areas of interest of China uh, being a member in the EBRD activities, and how it is how is the cooperation between the EBRD and the AIIB, so the A uh, the Asian, Asian. Investment Bank. 
uh, whose president we actually hosted um, uh, six weeks ago here in the same in the same seminar. It was a very interesting discussion as well. Um, so, so if you, I mean, you, you talked already about Central Asia, where I think there's some overlap um, in the operation, but you also talked about the Western Balkans, um, where China is increasingly active. And so we would love to hear, I guess, and Gerd Stahl would love to hear a little bit more on, you know, how do you cooperate with, with AIB and what are the areas of mutual interest and where's uh, there perhaps some uh, contrary interests? So China is indeed one of our shareholders with a very small share because I think it's 0.01% of the capital, but still it's, um, uh, it joined uh, the, the shareholders of the bank in 2016, I think. And um, so it, it's not represented in the board. So the, the cooperation we have is mainly through AIB indeed. And we have somebody, we have one representative of the EBRD in China who is uh, hosted by um, AIB, so working closely with them. I think what we are trying to do, and this is one of the features of the AIB, because they do not have any network. They are So they work very, one of the, the main way to develop is to co-finance some project with uh, other MDBs and they have co-finance project with uh, a number of MDBs and we did a number some project with AIB so where we were joining and uh, both providing a loan and so forth and for us what is very important in, in this respect and that's something which uh, uh, the AIB has also been um, I mean, uh, cautious about it, is to ensure that, I mean, in these cases, we work with the highest standard possible with our uh, procedures in terms of uh, all the control of, um, I mean, uh, competition, uh, the respect of the competition rules and um, uh, uh, eligibility criteria, uh, checking out uh, the background of the, of the promoters of the project and so forth. So we really bring in this discussion our, the, the high degree of standard we have and but but we ha do have a number project of co-financing of course we also and then you mentioned the two areas where it's particularly relevant even it's i mean uh, very strong uh, influence and role of china in uh, central asia and in uh, the western balkan so we are also as i was pointing out an instrument to find to have a alternative financing. So we provide alternative offers with, uh, and this is very important, I think, for the countries of operation. And we worked a lot with them. For example, we have been very active in Uzbekistan, who is uh, uh, engaging in a number of reform and very active in a number of areas, including, for example, on the green transition agenda. Try, uh, helping them to develop a pathway towards the greener, um, greener uh, energy policy and, and so forth. So I think that um, our strong presence in the ground and very close cooperation with um, the authorities are a way to, um, to counterbalance uh, China influence and, and weight in the region. You know, in a number of these countries, for example, we are developing uh, what we call investors forum or investors council, trying to, I mean, to ensure that the authorities work with the private sector, with representative of, of companies in order to identify what should be done to develop the private sector, which in our view is key for the, develop, the long term development of this country. So. I think that's it's um, and we are very um, it's amazing to see how um, the, the cooperation with this country is close. Of course, it may depend on I mean the political evolution and so forth. But um, we are seen, uh, for example, by Uzbekistan, but but by others also as a very key partner. And in terms of size of financing, we are very large in this country. So, so that I think it, our our role is really to diversify the options of financing to promote the reform agenda so also to avoid sort of i mean unicity and to i mean to to, to develop i mean to provide a um, sort of occidental european um, um, priorities and, and and so forth thank you i mean this is uh, of course a very important debate and um, one of the um, uh, executives at the uh, at the AIIB is actually a former chief economist of the EBID, as we know, Eric, Eric Bergloff. And um, uh, my understanding is that in many respects, the AIIB um, 
uh, wants to uh, follow perhaps in, in many respects the, the EBRD uh, model. So, uh, so there's a counterbalancing, but there's certainly also scope for, I guess, some, some mutually beneficial work um, between uh, in, in, in some of the countries of operation. But let me um, um, ask you, I mean, there, there's now quite a, quite a number of questions coming in and we have, well, we have a, a, few, a, bit, of, a bit of time to discuss the various aspects. But, but since you, I mean, since we are on various countries, um, you mentioned Uzbekistan. Let me ask a question by um, Antun uh, Mifsud Bonici, uh, who um, is asking a question about Mongolia. And I'm not sure whether you can directly answer that question, but um, it is about, um, uh, he states, the, the EBRD invests in the copper sector in Mongolia. How are you supervising the investment to promote good governance and sustainable supply chains? So, so very specific question. Perhaps you don't know about the copper investment directly in Mongolia, but I mean, in general, how, do, how to ensure good governance in your investments in, in countries where good governance often is quite weak? So that's, so that's, a, that's a very good question. I, I cannot answer indeed the specific project in Mongolia, but um, generally speaking, this is a key issue because we are intervening in, in countries which where generally you have a lot of challenges and in terms of governance, in terms of transparency and so forth. So what, what we are doing is uh, when, I mean, first of all, choose, choose with whom we work. And for example, there are countries in which we know that we cannot work uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, such area of the banking sector because, for example, the interests are too, I mean, it's too closely related to the public, uh, some, pub some policy makers or some uh, high policy figures. So we really select and have a lot of, I mean, um, um, due diligence to select the people with whom we work. And in this area, I think one of the key uh, asset, as I was referring, we have a very strong presence in the countries of operation. So we know very well the environment. And, you know, when we have, when you have people who are, I mean, working in the countries, uh, they have a much better grip and understanding of the links, the relationship, the overall environment and so forth. So this is uh, the first thing we are doing. We also have some, um, so then we work also closely in the countries in which we intervene with uh, uh, NGOs, civil society, so that I mean, we have a dialogue with them. They can bring us some concern and so forth. So this is a way also to, to be sure that, I mean, about what we are doing. We have also have internal mechanism with possible uh, appellate body for in, if, NGOs or CSO consider that there is a challenge, for example, in terms of working labor condition, or uh, so that there is also the possibility to have this sort of this external overview of what we are doing. And, um, and uh, I mean, these are the tools we are, we are using to, um, to ensure that uh, we are working uh, in the best condition. I mean, it's, Difficult to say it's 100% uh, waterproof and there is no issue, there, there are absolutely no issue, but we are doing putting a lot of means in this area. And the, the last element I wanted also to mention is that very often when we, I mean, we, when this is key uh, and when there are really a problem of governance, um, either we have, I mean, this is part of the discussion we have with the authorities in terms of the overall framework, and this is done very often in relation with IMF, for, for example, I will take the case of Ukraine, where you know the, the overall legal framework, rule of law and so forth is part of very high in the agenda with the IMF, the European Commission, and, and we are part of this discussion. And where there are issues more specific, and there also I can take an example with Ukraine, uh, we were invest we, we had invested in a, in a big uh, infrastructure project, which was very important for the country for development and so forth. But the agency monitoring this infrastructure were very poorly managed with very big problem of governance. And the, one of the conditions for us to provide some financing was really a deep change in the governance. And, and we will monitor this and, uh, and we disperse on, I mean, only if there are some progress in this area and we, are, I mean, we think that this is safe enough. So that's, that's um, what we do. Of course, I mean, it's always a judgment call and so forth, but I think that we are well equipped to deal with, uh, with uh, these difficulties. So we have a question here on um, perhaps more on uh, on the side of the company at the company level and you know what kind of support one can give um, on the one hand to SMEs. So there's a question by Catherine 
what are the specific ways in which SMEs can re receive support. And then there's a related question by um, a, a young uh, smart uh, economist and a colleague of mine, um, Julia Anderson, um, who's asking, well, could you discuss the trade-off between credit and equity support um, in EBRD, uh, these countries of operation? So, so if you can give us a bit of a sense of, so, so how does the financing really work for companies and for the private sector? Um, is it equity? Is it debt? Um, is there a trade-off? What about SMEs? I think that would be quite interesting. Thank you for, for this question. So, um, so for SMEs, we have basically, I mean, in, in the lending activity, we have basically uh, two ways to intervene. The first one is either through um, bank, bank. So, so we, we use bank, local bank as intermediate to, so as to finance um, SMEs. And that's the way, that's what the EIB is doing very often. And that's the way, I mean, which is very simple for us because you give a great big credit line and then the bank or they have the local credit and so forth and they can spread it um, in, on a large scale. So we, we do that. Um, but we also uh, do some direct financing. And what is very specific to our offer, as I was saying before, is this advisory function, which is we can we, we work with SMEs, identifying the, those whose model, which model seems the most promising, and so forth. We can see there are some potential for development, and then accompany them, financing some um, uh, advisory. Um, um, capabilities very often from the local consultant but we have a huge a huge um, panel of consultants that we can bring in with very high expertise so that and that I was to must, I must say I talked with a number of clients and I was surprised how highly appreciated it, it was uh, considered because it really helped the SMEs who often are I mean focusing on their I mean, business area and so forth to project and to, I mean, increase that degree of ambition and develop their strategy so as to grow. And, and I really saw some example very, for example, in, uh, in uh, Uzbekistan of a company's SME on, uh, in, uh, in the food area, we building some, I mean, it was a sort of um, uh, Bread, uh, bread, cookies, and so forth, and they really brought, I mean, increased and developed a full strategy with the support of the bank uh, and and this advisory function. So I think this is very well. Um, I mean, it has a lot of value, and then we can accompany with financing. We are doing mostly loan. I mean, but equity is possible. Equity in SME is difficult because it's very I mean, small, very costly. Very, we, we used to intervene and we are still uh, in some cases intervening, for example, in, in providing some support in financial intervention in IPO. So when privatization, so we, we, uh, we have some, uh, for example, we took some equity in banking sector in some countries and uh, or in on, on some uh, large SMEs. So that's, that's uh, always a possibility. I mean, we are doing that. Of course, this costs us a lot in terms of equity and so forth. I mean, it has a, uh, it's seen as more risky, so has a higher cost in capital, but um, but we are we are doing that. But overall, and we intervene a lot also through private equity fund, so taking stakes in private equity uh, and then uh, them investing directly in companies. So in equity, we have the same direct and indirect. It, in terms of size, it's it's smaller, but I think this is an area where which we want to develop. Uh, because in a, we will probably see also um, when getting out of the crisis that companies need more equity, less, I mean, there will be quite leverage probably uh, and more leverage than before. And so um, all the kind of support we can provide through equity will probably, or quasi equity, will probably be uh, on high demand. So that's something we, we are aware we want to develop. Uh, to develop. So um, we have um, perhaps two last, um, well, we have a bit of time. So we have two last questions that I really think uh, I want to I want to raise here. I mean, one is uh, by someone called Alessandro. He asked about the EU taxonomy and uh, whether or not the EBRD will, will adopt it to support the Green Deal. So that, that is, I think, an interesting question. Um, and then uh, we have two questions by 
one anonymous and one called Jasmine, Jasmine Plona about um, the EBID activities to sub-Saharan African countries. And you know, what, what is it that you are doing and could do, could do there? And, and perhaps let me throw a, a third question and then we sort of wrap it up after those three um, is by anonymous. Uh, and he's asking, or she's asking, what is your view on the bank's remaining investments in Russia, um, considering the deteriorating diplomatic relations at present? Um, so, um, so I think these, um, well, let me see if there's a, a last one, which I, I need to raise here. Um, how much? Well, perhaps let's take one more on climate change by, by Julia Galut. Galuccio, how much the climate change resilience objective adaptation to climate change is part of financing the recovery. So if, if you can say a bit more about the climate change resilience. So then we have, I think, four nice questions to end our conversation. Thank you. Um, so I will start. Um, I will start with the climate change at TCA uh, taxonomy and, and uh, resilience. Um, on the um, taxonomy, I think that uh, we will, uh, I mean, we, um, I, it's difficult for me to know whether we will exactly implement, implement the taxonomy. What we will do is uh, implementing the TCFD, so the, the, the recommendation of the you know, task force for disclosure on the climate uh, investment. So this, we, we will apply that in the way we um, we disclose our own investment, you know, on the portfolio activity. You know, we have some capital we invest uh, that generate revenue. So, and we will have we will implement all the recommendation of the TCFD, which is, uh, and I think that the EU taxonomy is, is it's consistent with that. It's a way to implement it. What we are doing also is so we are on, we have a sort of agreed methodology with among multilateral the multilateral development bank to define what is green and what is not green. So we have a full framework to do, and when we say we will have 50% of our investment in green, this is related to this common framework, which we have in common with the different all the MDBs, and which define, I mean, uh, it's a sort of categorization of investment, and uh, we have uh, we calculate for each project whether it has a green impact or not a green impact, uh, and the green impact being that uh, basically that it reduce it has a, as effect to reduce the uh, greenhouse emission gas. Uh, so that's that's something we applied. So I think it's consistent, but it's not exactly the same terms as, as the taxonomy. And then we have a third um, workflow, which is the Paris alignment, which is also something slightly different. Uh, it can be, and, and in the past, so we have, we have also developed this methodology with the other MDBs, and now we are working on how to um, translate it to our own financing. And the Paris alignment is, I mean, uh, it's the fact to, to consider that all the financing needs to be uh, consistent with the, the Paris objective and the uh, commitment, the trajectory is defined by the countries to reach that objective. So it's same logic, but not exactly the same also than the green uh, finance. What I what I think is very important uh, in my view is that, I mean, all these methodologies are relatively complex and uh, we need, there is still quite a lot of work to ensure that everybody applies it in a consistent manner with the same tools and so forth. And this is not completely um, easy. I think that uh, all the financial institutions are working very hard on, very hard on the, for example, implementing the TCFD principle. But uh, you made so there is, I think, further work to be done in this area, and we very um, look forward to seeing all the work done by the European Commission on the non non financial disclosure rules. I think that would be also a big step in standardizing uh, the reporting on uh, on the green uh, agenda. Um, Adaptation is indeed, um, increasing the resilience and adaptation is indeed one important uh, area for the green financing. We have issued, we are, I think we are one of the first financial institutions to issue resilience bonds, so bonds which uh, have for purpose to finance adaptation project. And indeed that should be, I mean, 
must be part of the recovery, better by building back better because it's investment that are needed in order to uh, ensure stronger resilience. So I think that's clearly part of uh, of the agenda we need to support. Um, on uh, um, sub-Saharan countries, uh, sub-Saharan uh, Afri Africa. This is an issue which is really uh, very topical because our shareholders have uh, um, acknowledged, I mean, have um, stated that they have a strategic interest in uh, for the EBRD to possibly intervene in Africa, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, because now we are intervening in the north. Um, it's It makes sense, my personal view is that it makes sense because uh, it's as I see the mandate of the EBRD as stabilizing the European neighborhood, I think that it's very clear that Sub-Saharan Africa, if it's, even if it's not a direct neighborhood, it's a very close neighborhood. And everything going on in I mean, economic development, um, uh, economic stabilization is very important if we want also to um, ensure, I mean, to, to facilitate uh, uh, fight against un unemployment, uh, have a, keep under control the migration pressure and so forth. I think that's, I mean, we know and secure, and it has also a huge security impact. So I, we know that stabilization of sub-Saharan countries is very important for the stability of Europe. I think it's it's very clear. And we know the, the needs are absolutely huge. And so I think that it would make, I mean, makes a lot of sense if uh, we use all the financial instrument and in view also of the debt situation of Africa, I think that now it's very clear that a number of countries would be in a very difficult public debt situation. And so forth, development of the private sector would be a very efficient way to, uh, I mean, it would be an important element uh, of develop for development. This was the logic of the Compact for Africa uh, launched by Germany in the context of the G20. I think our approach where we develop both reform and uh, financing could make sense. Of course, this is for shareholders to discuss. And um, what would be important in my view is to uh, work with all the players uh, intervening in Africa. And that's where, I mean, I think cooperation with African Development Bank, but also bilateral um, institutions which are very present, KFW, IFD, and so forth, are, are important players in these countries. So as to ensure that we do not intervene to crowd out, crowd out, crowd out other uh, players, other uh, financial institutions, but really to bring added value and so forth. And I think that, as you know, we expanded in, semi, in the uh, Mediterranean region uh, quite successfully, being able to increase the overall volume of financing and doing new projects. So I think that we should be able to do it in Africa, but I mean, this is still um, to be decided and to be discussed. In any case, I think it should be very incremental and progressive because, I mean, this new geography quite challenging. So I think we need, we need to, to start and learn from uh, focusing on, on few countries um, at the beginning. But of course, it would be a, a big, I mean, a big step again for, for the EBRD. And I think that uh, we need also, we would need also to cl work closely with the EIB so as to ensure that we complement each other in this area. And then the, the last question was on Russia. So in Russia, we are not doing any new financing since uh, 2014. So only managing the portfolio, and we had. So it was one of the it was one of the main country for investment uh, before. So we had quite a radical shift. No new financing in, in Russia since 2014, and then it corresponded to a very large increase of our activities in Mediterranean countries. Um, so now we are managing our portfolio. It's reducing progressively, no new money at all. I mean, you know, exceptionally when we have a sort of, for example, equity share that we needs to be, uh, uh, you know, we need to, to protect our interest, but uh, it's decreasing progressively. I think it's, uh, I mean, very strong, clear policy guidance from our shareholders. Um, Russia would like to get more support from the EBRD, or at least at te on technical cooperation. But at that stage, uh, this is not uh, this is not what we are. In. We are not engaged into that. Of course, we see. I mean, this is very much dependent on the evolution of the geopolitical discussion and the tension and so forth. And I don't. I mean, I think that the recent development will not. Um, 
with not alleviate the tension to, to say it mildly. But uh, but Russia is an active um, uh, shareholder and and uh, they keep it, they keep an interest in, in the EPRD. I think there are also there are some cases where we we can support, for example, Russian companies investing in in third countries, but this is not investment in Russia. So that's a different kind of activity. Um, but of course, I mean it's. The situation is as it was. It is, and as I was saying, it's very clear now, and it's it's also true, I think, for the EIB. So we have a, a sort of um, stand uh, standby situation. So I can't resist just asking you a tiny last question, which uh, relates to, I mean, uh, the the Russia situation, but it's it's about uh, gas pipelines, and also because it there, there is this question. Um, funding of gas pipelines, is it compatible with uh, with the Green Deal and the green ambitions of the EBRD? Um, and of course, it's that's climate discussion, but it's also a geopolitical discussion. If you can say one word on that, I think that would be very interesting. I mean, the gas discussion is very, very, I mean, topical currently in the EBRD because um, we are dealing with countries, and I would not address specifically the pipeline, but more I mean, gas project, and it's clear, I think, I mean, and then it could be different between upstream development of upstream capacity and then using gas as a source of energy. Uh, it's, I mean, it's clear that, I mean, this is a challenging question, but we are dealing with countries which are uh, very, currently, a lot of them are very dependent on coal. Uh, for example, when you look at the Western Balkans, 70% of the electricity comes from coal. So, um, and, and the level of development in some countries is very, very behind. I mean, much, much more behind than the EU. And the, also the consumption, I mean, the use of energy consumption per GDP and so forth, much lower. So the, the challenge is, uh, I think, to see what if, whether gas has a role to play in the transition or not and under what condition. And I think that, uh, in my view, it would be, it's very difficult uh, to um, to deny for some countries very strongly dependent on coal that gas may have a positive role to play, positive contribution. But then I think we need to avoid um, to lock in some I mean, very long term capacities that will not be uh, phased out later on to postpone some investment in renewables that would be uh, more beneficial. So I think it very much depends on the, I mean, the starting situation, country by country, the commitments to the Paris alignment, uh, in what pathway it, it develops and so forth. But it's very, it's very, and I think there is one important element, a point I wanted to make. Countries must be consistent. I mean, our shareholders and everybody needs to be consistent and not to be more, I mean, um, demanding for third countries and what we are doing for ourselves in a way. And we have to take into account the, develop the, the level of development. And, you know, there is this approach on differentiated responsibilities and so forth. And this needs to be taken on board. So we are trying to develop, a, I mean, a strategy which is uh, but it, uh, consistent with this principle, but it's, it's quite, uh, I mean, a lot of discussion around that right now. And very up-to-date issue, I must say. Very good. Um, so I, I think I think our time I'd, our time is up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Odile, for um, you know being here with us and uh, you know really answering all the many questions that came in. And you've seen we've we've traveled from Mongolia to the Western Balkans to Uzbekistan um, to of course the countries of operation to EU taxonomy. So we covered a lot of ground, um, which shows really how important and how big. Um, the bank is and how much also um, I'm sure many in those of those who watched us uh, care about uh, understanding what you are what you're doing, um, how you're doing things. And so I think it was a very helpful and uh, informative discussion. So thank you so much, Odile, for joining us today. And thank you to, the, to you, our listeners, for listening, watching us and being so active on the questions. Until next time, bye bye. Thank you, Odile. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good.